Now I would like to welcome Dr. M welcome Miss Anna Sophia von Selzing. Miss Selzing is the daughter of the last inheritor, Frederick von Selzing, of the entailed state Bibi. She is author and co-editor of the book Bibi, an entitled state tells its story. Anna is also a doctoral student at the Department of Public Health and uh, Caring Sciences, Family Medicine and Preventive Medicine section, section Uppsala University. The title of Miss Selzing's paper is The Von Selzing Family History and the 18th Century Collection of Ottoman Art at Bibi. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Miss Anna. Thank you. Um, first of all, a warm thank you to the Orientalist Museum and especially also a thank you to Dr. Olga Nefedova, who primarily asked me to uh, give this presentation. This will be quite a different um, presentation from what you've heard yesterday and today because this is uh, more like a guided tour in our home. Uh, not really art history as it should be, because I'm an orthopedic surgeon and absolutely not in the field of research in the art history or literature like we heard today, yesterday, uh, but uh, into research in the field of medicine. But uh, the story is that uh, I grew up together with my three brothers at this estate, Bibi, where this Ottoman collection uh, from the 18th century was kept for about 230 years. I will see. I'll talk about the Selsing family history, about the diplomats and the collection, and also the diplomatic archive kept in our home, and the estate, the context. During the 18th century, the Ottoman Empire became one of Sweden's most important political allies, and this led to an intensification of contacts, contacts in many fields. Trade, for example, in the 18th century also witnessed an upsurge of Swedish interest in the Turkish language and culture. Expeditions were sent off, manuscripts were collected, and several Swedes learned the Turkish language. The Selsings family, came to play a particularly important role in Swedish Ottoman contacts. For nearly 70 years, the Swedish legation was manned by Gustav Selsing the Elderly, the Elder, and his sons, Gustav and Ulrich. To be a diplomat in the 18th century, you needed many different kinds of skill primarily a good knowledge of Turkish, which was not at all easy to come by in the 18th century in Sweden. But both the Selsing brothers studied Oriental languages at Uppsala University and learned Turkish, and a great deal about diplomatic life in Constantinople from their father. They also took an interest in history, geography, religion, social life and culture, all of which were important topics for a diplomat to be well versed in. It was also important to learn about the life and ceremonies of the Ottoman state so that diplomatic duties could be performed with decorum. The Ottoman court attached great importance to audiences with senior dignitaries as you all know, of course. During their time in Constantinople, the brothers Gustav and Ulrich put together a collection of art, books, and artifacts, which in various ways reflects their diplomatic assignment 
and their great fondness of Ottoman history and culture. In the 18th century, this collection was not at all unique. Most diplomats in Constantinople commissioned paintings to immortalize their audience with the Sultan or purchase costume pictures and books as aids to their diplomatic duties. The unique thing about the Selsing family collection is that it has been preserved intact by the family which first created it. Thanks to the entail created by Ulrich Selsing, posterity more than 200 years later can still acquaint itself with a unique treasury of an art and books. This as an introduction. But it all started with our king, Karl XII of Sweden, Charles. And he was defeated at the Battle of Boltava in 1709. And there he was accompanied by Gustav Selsing the Elderly. And we found his uh, diary, among many other things, in our house. And here it says, in June 1709, the Battle of Poltava on the 28th. Short notice. And then, in the 1st of July, they went over the river Dnieper. And that was, of course, because Charles XII, he was defeated by the Russians, and he had escaped into Turkey. In Turkey, Gustav Selsing worked as a commission secretary for Karl the, the Twelfth, and he was, moved on to Constantinople, where his duty, where his mission was to negotiate with uh, the Sultan about Karl the Twelfth to be uh, about uh, our king to. Uh, stay in uh, Bender and that uh, he could uh, be supported by the Sultan and especially there were negotiations of course of getting the Sultan on the s side of the Swedes so that we would together fight against the Russians. Uh, he was in 1718 upon when he returned to Sweden, ennobled for his different services. One service was in 1711, uh, he had a mission from his king to deliver a paper concerning uh, the Grand Vizier not being quite honest to the uh, sultan and going behind his back and negotiating with the Russians. And therefore, this story was written on a piece of paper and hidden in this book where, and then Gustav Selsing, the elderly, he dressed himself as a Turk and on a Friday, he stepped forward when the Sultan was on his way to uh, Hagia Sophia, to the mosque. Uh, he stepped forward and delivered this very book with a piece of paper telling the true story about the Grand Vizier and what was happening behind the Sultan's back. And then he was obviously uh, put into prison right away but they discovered who he was, and uh, he was released, and uh, the Sultan understood the whole picture, and the Grand Vizier, he was a head shorter. <laughs> As a gift, Gustav Selfing the Elder was given this beautiful kaftan, which was kept at Bibi for all those years. Gustav Selsing, uh, the son, 
he came in uh, 1745 to uh, Constantinople after being uh, educated at Uppsala University, studying uh, Oriental languages, but also Turkish. And then his mission, in fact, was mostly to take care of papers. He was very young, uh, 1745, when he arrived. And uh, uh, letters sent from d different embassies. But uh, in fact, there was a very delicate political situation. Uh, the Swedes staying in the, the Swedes um, uh, were in a position, a political position, to uh, what do you call it? Not, not to stabilize, but uh, he had. Uh, anyway, he went directly into political negotiations, and he was very successful in preventing the Russians to fight against the Swedes. And therefore, he was later on uh, not only noble family, which he was, but he was also, he became a baron. And this is the coat of arms uh, surrounded by the Turks. Ulrich Selsing is an extraordinary person and he, in fact, uh, just continued the work of his brother, uh, being an ambassador in Turkey, in Constantinople. But he was a fantastic person and took great interest into everything that he came across, which you will see many signs of later on in this presentation. But he also uh, made this will to the right. This means entailed estate will in 1805, which was the prerequisite to maintain the collection in our family. This is Bibi, an estate 120 kilometers from Stockholm in Sweden. The heritage of this entire estate was at the beginning not quite clear. Gustav Selsing, he came back from Turkey when the king left in 1714 and he got married and got 12 children. But only one brother, Frederick, had a child. Gustav and Ulrich never married, and, but their brother did. And that is then the success of uh, the following family story, so to say. As you can see, uh, at this stage, that was a difficult time because Lars Gustav, he had two sons, only that this one, who was the eldest one, supposed to inherit it all, he died in 1813, only 19 years old, in Germany, uh, and is also buried over there. But luckily enough, his El, uh, younger brother, he was uh, married and had many children. So the family could continue further on until 2008 when the entailed estate uh, stopped by the death of our father. Uh, the Swedish government decided in 1963 that the entailed estate uh, was not modern, uh, just as it, it has happened in all other European countries. Uh, and uh, it should stop when the man who was the uh, uh, 
owner of the entailed estate died. And that happened to us, as you see, in 2008 when our father died. But as I said, there was a very difficult time here when it could have all ended. And that was uh, due to these two uh, boys, the one dying and maybe if he had no children. But behind everything, there is a strong woman, <laughs> you know. And this is Friedrika Gustava Selsing. Together with her small son, Friedrich Ulrich Selsing, and this is her husband around her neck in the medallion. And the, that's the creator of the entailed estate, Ulrich Selsing. And he was very young when his brother died in Germany, so she took care of it all. And she did it in a very good way. So everything could continue. Now the guided tour. This is the entrance. The staircase going upwards with all over Turkish paintings, Ottoman paintings. <coughs> Even here. But you see, we are in Sweden, so of course there is also a moose. <coughs> And this is a home which is different to what we have heard of yesterday and this morning, mostly museums keeping these things. But in fact, this is our home. This is the entrance to the Turkish room. Uh, at the beginning, the, all the artifacts the paintings, 103 of them, were uh, transported to Sweden, but they stayed in Stockholm where the brothers bought two houses. And they displayed all those paintings in their uh, houses in Stockholm at the beginning where many people could come and see this big, extraordinary, strange uh, looking people on the walls, uh, very odd in the late 19th, 18th century. The Turkish room was, after the death of Ulrich, created most likely by uh, Friedrika Gustava. She knew a lot about uh, her, the Ulrich Selsing. She had a very good relationship to him. And as her husband died in 1810, uh, she was on her own as the son was so young. But the, we think it is absolutely not quite sure, but this room was created by her. Not the ceiling, though. That's from the um, 16th century, 17th century, uh, painted when a family lived for 100 years in Bibi before the Selsings bought this estate. And how did that come? The Selsings, they were not only diplomats, they also did some trading. So they made a fortune, in fact. And when they came back to Sweden, they bought <laughs> Bibi and several other estates. Altogether, a huge estate, in fact. And it was decided upon in the will of Ulrich that all those Turkish paintings should be placed at Bibi. So you see, this is a room with many different styles. The divans, originally this tissue was bought in the bazaar in Constantinople. But there are also typical Swedish uh, chairs from the Rococo, 
and empire, empire, yeah, empire, uh, period. But the most important, of course, are those huge paintings of the two embassies coming to Sweden and the Sultan tree, and surrounded by costume pictures. From the library, there is another small entrance, and you can see this view. And this is the summer, uh, Sultan Summer Palace, Sadadabad, in the Garden of Kagitan. Ex excuse my pronunciation. Surrounded also by costume pictures and palaces and a Venetian and chandelier and Turkish lamps. Quite a mixture, but in fact still our home. The, these big paintings are interesting as uh, Karl XII, he never paid his bill in Turkey. He left uh, and uh, then unexpectedly, in fact, Mustafa Aga came to uh, reclaim and wanted the Swedish government to, to pay their debts to the Ottoman Empire. He had no, no success because our finances were very bad at the time. So he left without money. But he was followed by another embassy five years later. This painting is made by Georg Engelhard Skröder, who was at the court at the time of the King Frederick I. You can see on this, this picture, in fact, that it, it's really difficult to see, but that's a um, piece of germ paper, German newspaper, which was wrapped on the side of the paintings. This is the next embassy coming to Sweden, more successful in their negotiations with the uh, government. The side Mehmed Effendi with his courtiers. And this is the dragoman, Karadja, his name is. This is very strange. And we don't know yet why is there a dog in this painting. No one has so far been able to explain it, why this painter chose to uh, include a dog in the um, painting. The Ottoman Sultan tr tree is one of three, the first ones in fact ever made. Uh, and from Osman I to Abdul Al Hamid, who was then the Sultan when Ulrich Selsing left Turkey. But Ulrich, he knew that we wouldn't be able to know who these sultans were, so he wrote them in this uh, small piece of paper just on the side of the sultan tree. Instructions to the inheritors. And on one side, you can see this nice uh, painting of the Sultan's palace, palace at Besiktas and the Sultan being rowed in this barge. And this is the upper hall and staircase where you see many paintings showing the surroundings of the Bosporus the way up to the Black Sea. And here you have a, a painting of the uh, Belgrade Forest. And this one is the same of the uh, Sultan in his barge. 
there are no names, as you have discovered. Uh, and that is because we, for ages, didn't know who the painter was. There, was, uh, there were many theories. And uh, uh, Professor Karin Ordal, maybe someone of you know her, uh, she has written a book of our collection with her researchers. They have tried to uh, find out who is the artist of all or just a few of them. And they finally came up with suggestions like uh, François Smith, uh, André Favray, and uh, John van der Steen, which in fact uh, showed to be quite correct. Later on, when we discovered uh, some documents with letters, this is the sitting room with the panoramic views of uh, the uh, top copy. And this is another painting from the Asian side looking over top copy palace. And these audience paintings, like most ambassadors, they had their paintings uh, when they were at the audience by the Sultan. The brothers, they were great collectors, in fact. Uh, not just like you think that men would bring home, but they also had some purses and different kinds of spoons out of shirt, turtle shells, small silver jar, and especially they took a great interest in books and manuscripts. This was called the Turkish chest of drawers and on top of it there was the Turkish kaftan kept for many, many years. This is a collection of what they collected. In fact, uh, quite different things. This is very handy, for instance, traveling cutlery set. This celadon dish, there were three of them, was also given uh, from the Sultan to Gustav Selzing the elderly. They brought embroidered towels, very nice ones, and coffee cup holders. And here you see some purses and the spoons and other cups and even prayer rolls. What about the diplomatic life of the uh, Selsings as we have understood it? Our interpretation, maybe you will see different things. First, you have to be important. And to be important in these days, it was also necessary to have a nice palace. So in 1755, Gustav Selsing the Younger, he bought a piece of land. And there was this kiosk, de Suède à Pera, in the area of Pera. It burnt several times and was totally destroyed in, seven, in um, 1818 and rebuilt. And today it looks like this. This is the oldest uh, Swedish property in the, in the world. This is the view they had from their office in the Swedish embassy, overlooking, I mean, to this audience, of course, this is a very familiar view. But still, it's quite impressive that they 
actually lived here. This is the view from their windows. And we know that because we found those letters from the painters. And this one is from Jan van der Steen, who actually painted those and several of the others. That, what, that we know uh, he is writing to Ulrich Selsing about he being delayed in his paintings. And we also know, this is from the France, uh, artist Francois Smith, that he also uh, did some paintings. It was extremely important, as for everyone, we have heard about uh, being received by the Sultan. And uh, this is the res uh, re audiences uh, by Ulrich Selsing. And we know a lot about this audience because this is written in a document by Moiraja Dozon uh, in many pages, very detailed information, in fact, exactly how they started in the morning, how they went over the Bosporus, how they were uh, taken care of by the Janishars, how they had breakfast with the Janishars, and so on. Uh, interesting is that Ulrich Selsing, uh, he had a message to the Sultan, mostly as we have understood and it, as it is written in the report, it was just saying hello and then in a very uh, polite way and then sort of disappear again. But he had a message. Uh, to tell the Sultan that uh, the king, Gustav III, he was uh, uh, crowned at the time. So he had some news for the Sultan. And that was written like a very important thing in this audience. And it is also noted that the Sultan was pleased to hear that. Gustav III had been crowned. It's uh, quite funny, in fact. Uh, there were some people very important to uh, the Swedish brothers. In their duty as diplomats, they had to get advices from others, and especially from this French in the beginning a military person who uh, he was of a noble family in France and moved to Constantinople and he was he converted into Islam and then his name was Ahmed Pasha and uh, he gave a lot of advices and was very important to especially Gustav Selting the younger and also the English ambassador, like everyone else, uh, he had also a painting on himself from the audience at, by, at the Sultan. And this is an en engraving from 1769. We found a lot of uh, interesting things in a forgotten chest. I'll soon tell you about it. One thing is those sample of feathers from Heron for Queen Louisa Ulrika. Isn't that strange? They collected absolutely everything. And uh, they wanted to uh, help in, in trading. So I'm sure she got those feathers of Heron. There was another man who was maybe the most important person for the diplomats, uh, Moiraja Dozon. Maybe some of you have heard about this uh, work of his fantastic Tableau General de l'Empire d'Ottoman uh, in three volumes, absolutely huge. We do not have these three huge volumes at Bibi, but we found this small uh, manuscript 
a preliminary work to this fantastic book. They had to study a lot as diplomats, and of course, like all the others, you had to learn about the ceremonies and the costumes and the dignitaries uh, to be able to play the political role they were supposed to. And this is an uh, old book from 1723 showing all the different costumes the Kislar Agassi, for instance, here. And Ulrich himself, he dressed himself like a Turk. And there is a small miniature of him dressed like a Turk. There is also a box folder, 106 of those paintings. And there are 46 of these uh, other costume paintings. These are oil on canvas. Possibly from Moore School. Not from Moore itself, because this is later on, but from Moore School. They took great interest in books. So there was a library created at Bibi. Uh, and there are books, sort of 3,000 volumes at the beginning. Uh, this is the old library with uh, books from the 17th and 18th century, but even some from the 16th century. History, geography, religion, diplomatic books, you know, di different kinds of books on diplomacy. But they also collected very important manuscripts and books from early on. And this is, in fact, Gustav Selsing, the elderly, who, uh, in one way or another, maybe on his, when he returned from Turkey to Sweden, uh, he got this book, the Codex Caesareus Obsaliensis. It's called, it's the... Uh, Emperor's Bible, it's called. But even more interesting is Shanam by the Persian poet Firdavsi in the year 1000. And all those old manuscripts, they realized the value and thought it was really important to uh, save them, so they donated the manuscripts and the books to Uppsala uh, University Library, where they still are kept. Beautiful paintings. And of course, uh, they had a lot of engravings of the different uh, religious uh, ceremonies, like the uh, Sufis, and the whirling dervishes, and also from different mosques, uh, Hagia Sophia especially, there were quite a few of these engravings. And a small uh, view of some of the other paintings, not so big ones, Tarabia, where the embassies had their summer houses. The Swedes, as well as the French, for instance. And this is a picture from the uh, Belgrade forest with some tents. But they also took an interest in how to dress. So, uh, there are those uh, dresses from the first one. That's uh, the Gustav Selsing, and he had this. This is actually English-inspired dress, and the Order of the North Star. And this dress in red velvet is. Uh, 
decorated with a, a Polish, the Order of the White Star. No, sorry, uh, the Order of the White Eagle. And this is a silk skirt, still. We had sort of six of them left. They saved everything. And also uh, a dress, Rococo dress. And these are findings from the attic. Absolutely obligatory in an entailed state. You save everything for the next generation and the next and the next and the next. Nothing left, BB, as you can see. So in the attic to be found. Different dresses, even wedding dresses. What about the diplomatic archive? Of course, they sent off the letters and reports from Constantinople to the, the Swedish uh, government, but they kept all the concepts in their own archive and brought back to Sweden. And we found a chest. Upon our father's death in 2008, of course we had to go around and look for things that we didn't know about earlier, and we found this chest. It was absolutely full and it was locked and it was not possible to open. We found one key after two days of looking, searching. But the other one, it didn't go when it opened. So uh, our brother, Peter, came with his, uh, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. cool food. Yeah. And, well, it opened. And we found most interesting documents, among others, this dictionary from the Selsing brothers learning Turkish and Arabic, they knew many languages. But the interesting thing was on top of this chest, there was a note by our grandfather. This belongs to the archive three. Must not be open and be well taken care of. Erlof von Selsing and locked. Not anymore though. And we found those reports from the Consul General in Aleppo, for instance, from Alexandria, from Izmir, from many other places, nicely put together like that by our grandfather, originally sent in those cases to Sweden. But they kept everything, and we found a lot of maps of course, also for educational purposes. And we found a chiffre, or several, in fact. And that's quite funny to see the secret language they were using. For instance, the ambassador of uh, England, he was the Fesson. <laughs> and in Venice, Le Babou. <laughs> <laughs> well. This house has kept all of this for 230 years. That's an old building, old mansion, uh, constructed of huge logs of pine tree. And we did this, I don't know the word in English, where you can see the age of a tree. Dendrochronology. 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 Excellent. <laughs> and that was analyzed at the University of Lund in the southern part of Sweden, the only place where we do this registration, uh, which is absolutely complete registration. And it was said, 1608, 1610, uh, these logs were cut, the forest was cut. Well, a little bit how the other rooms, dining room, 
see Charles the Twelfth again and his father <coughs> and several other kings around the table. And here the family portraits, the, gra the father of uh, Gustav Selsing the Elder, and a gift from the Sultan. This is the green guest room. You see all over there was some pale aquarelles, sketches from the very beginning for John van der Steen, who then later on made oil on canvas. And this is the estate itself, just a normal farm. In the beginning, there was also a mining industry supporting the whole estate and making the economy better. But later on, just farming. And we had some cows to support the life of the culture as well as normal farming. But there are some interesting findings in the barns. For instance, like everything was kept, even those old carriages, horse carriages. <coughs> to end with, we had no giraffe. <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> I love that story of yours <laughs> with, with the giraffes. And we got no moose, but we had a moose of ourselves. And this is also something that was kept, you know, for, as you do, for generations. And this is, in fact, a race by, this is man is Henrik Selsing. Uh, and this is in Stockholm, 1909. Uh, competition among the car and the horse and the moose. <laughs> that and the story tells that there was a big noise when the uh, car started and the horse got really scared and went on his back feet and the moose <laughs> rushed into the forest. <laughs> Thank you. In 2002, uh, the professor Karin Ordal made an excellent work in this book with a couple of researchers to find out who painted all those uh, Turkish paintings and uh, the objects and so on. And uh, that's sort of a research report, more or less, but very, very nice, and it's in Swedish. And this book we have made uh, recently. It was uh, published last year <coughs> to make a picture of the whole story from which you got a short version today. Thank you. I just wondered if your family was in any way connected. Am I Anyway, connected with the garden pavilions in the form of a Turkish tent, because I believe there were oh, you they, mean they, the one in Stockholm England made of canvas, but I think the ones near Stockholm were were made of copper. Yes, it's of, of it's of copper. Tent. But would that would that be your family that no, do no, it is not. You see, there were several uh, taking great interest in uh, Turkish traditions. And for those who are thinking of the Turkish collection today, uh, we can say that it will be in the future presented uh, uh, to a big international audience uh, uh, in a museum. <laughs>